Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Intentional Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Campion, and I am delighted to be joined today by Candice Millard, the incredible Candice Millard. If you don't know Candice, uh, I'll be honest, you're kind of missing out. Uh, she's awesome. She is the author of four incredible books in the so-called narrative nonfiction space. Basically, she is an expert at turning history into absolute page-turning drama that feels like and reads like some of the best fiction that you've ever read. So she's got an incredible talent for that. After discovering Candace's work a few years back, she quickly became one of my favorite authors, right up there with the likes of David McCullough and Eric Larson. For me, she's now in the category of if she writes it, I read it. I wanted to have Candace on the podcast partly because I wanted to introduce more people to her work. Now, she's already a world famous author with multiple New York Times bestselling books, um, but I've just enjoyed reading her work so much that I really wanted to spotlight her on this podcast uh, to my listeners and to my uh, newsletter readers as well. Um, I also wanted to ask her questions about everything from her research and writing process to the inside scoop on some of her books, to her own experience as a parent um, and as someone who's actually dealt with tragedy in her own life uh, a few times, similar to the characters that she writes about. So we get into all of that and more in this discussion. Um, I'm super grateful that Candace agreed to come on the podcast. She's so cool. And I think you're really going to love this. Before I go, just a quick reminder to subscribe to my newsletter, Intentional Wisdom. You can find that at gregcampion.substack.com. I send one email every other week where I break down what I'm learning from all of my amazing guests, just like Candace. I will share more of the backstory on this episode in the next issue. So head over to gregcampion.substack.com and check that out. All right, enough intro. Here is Candace Millard. All right, Candace Millard, welcome to the Intentional Wisdom Podcast. Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited uh, to have you here. Uh, this is really a true honor for me. Uh, I am Thank you. a big fan of your work. So, of course, for any of our listeners who don't know you, um, you uh, write excellent books in the genre. I think that's um, mostly known as narrative nonfiction. Um, that's right. And I've been kind of reading and loving this genre for a long time now, probably, you know, going back 20 years or so. And probably first entree into this world uh, it was kind of the David McCullough. And then I eventually mm. found uh, Eric Larson. Yes. And, uh, and then uh, those two became everything McCullough writes, I have to read. Everything Larson <laughs> writes, I read. And now, Same. And now Millard <laughs> is on that list. It's like less than I'm a handful honored. of authors that are like, mm. okay, if you write it. I'm reading it. So um, I, I just I just love how you are able to take, you know, true stories from history and make those into absolute page turners and really build up characters so that you feel like you know them personally. It's really a talent that you have and a skill. So I'm... I, I'm Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, a little bit about how you do it. But to start, I'm going to ask you the ultimate lazy man podcast host question. <laughs> and I was going to ask you, for our listeners who don't know you, if you wouldn't mind just um, giving a quick uh, description of the premise of each of the four books that you've written, because I know you will do it much more eloquently than I will. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that that's true. The elevator pitch is always uh, difficult. But um, so the first one's called River of Doubt, and it's about a trip that Theodore Roosevelt took down an unmapped river in the Amazon in 1914. And Three men died on that trip, and Roosevelt nearly took his own life. So it's this insane story, and it's also about evolution and the Amazon. I worked at National Geographic for six years, so I really got to dig into that. I love a lot of science. Um, so just an incredible true story. Um, my second is about the assassination of James Garfield. It's called Destiny of the Republic. And I always say, you know, if you think that you're not interested in James Garfield, you're wrong. <laughs> He would have been one of our greatest presidents. He was incredibly brilliant and brave and kind, and he never should have died. So that's that story. Um, my third book was called Hero of the Empire. It's about Winston Churchill, a young Winston Churchill, and he was 24 years old. And he went to um, South Africa to cover the Boer War. 
And he was captured and he was taken as a prisoner of war. And being Winston Churchill, he escaped and he made it across almost 300 miles of enemy territory by himself. No weapon, no food, no map, nothing. Um, and it's what launched, he became this hero um, in the British Empire and it's what launched his political career. And then my most recent is called River of the Gods. And it's about the search for the source of the Nile, um, but it's about these three men who are incredibly different, but all just fascinating and totally messed up. At least the first two, the British explorers, <laughs> a lot of really bad flaws, but really, really fascinating. And it's about um, their relationship and the betrayal of that uh, friendship that they had. And the third man is um, Sidi Mubarak Bombay, who was captured as a child and from his village in East Africa, taken in India, where he was enslaved for 20 years. Um, but he ends up coming back to Africa and becoming, I think, without question, the most accomplished guide in the history of African exploration. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that much more eloquently <laughs> than I would. Um, I, so the way I've consumed your books uh, is, I think I, st I started with The River of Doubt. Uh, then hmm. I read... Um, Actually, then I read A River of the Gods. And then oh, really? I read okay. very recently. So like this year, I read Destiny of the Republic. And then I feel like I have to come clean about this, but I'm only halfway <laughs> through Hero of the Empire. So don't no, worry about ruining no it for me because I've already listened to enough of your interviews. I think I know what's going <laughs> Well, you know he survived, yes, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. But um, all of those characters you just described, like I feel after having read your books, I feel like I know them so much better. And I have, mm. you know, certainly for some of them, like have developed a real um, affinity for, and especially mm. Garfield. Like I th right. that was, yeah. I love the way you described that. Like if you think you were not interested in Garfield, <laughs> you're wrong. Basically um, you just haven't heard about him because um, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'd love to talk about him because super, super interesting and just like, Oh my gosh, what an amazing person. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. so glad you've almost you've sort of brought him back to life in a in a way. But um, I guess what I'd like to ask you maybe to start is mm -hmm. a lot of the books that you write um, are not about the necessarily like the 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 headline moments of glory that we would commonly associate with uh, Churchill or Roosevelt, um, but they're about you know either other stories in their lives or moments of suffering um, or, you know, moments of being tested. And I think I, I may have heard you describe this in the past is that you think that, uh, you know, that this is where some of the, the true character uh, of some of these historical figures is, is really revealed in these moments of struggle or being tested. So tell me a little bit about that and how, just how you think about that generally. And then maybe we can talk about some of these characters and how they were really tested. That's exactly right. I mean, what interests me, I mean, I think all of, um, you know, all of us, those of us who like to write, especially, I think, well, I was going to say, especially people who write nonfiction, but that's not true. It's, I read a lot of fiction and I think we're all interested in human nature. And even when I was at National Geographic, I was interested in the science and natural history and everything, but I was always interested in the human stories because while everything else changes, human nature does not, right? And we can see ourselves and these people who seem, so, they're so famous, they seem almost mythical. You take Winston Churchill, Theodore Roosevelt, you think, I, I mean, I have no connection to Winston Churchill, but I can understand um, the, some of the things that he's feeling, right? And as you said, I mean, to me, and this is kind of developed as I work, um, as I was working on these books, I was realizing, to me, I can truly see somebody's character, not at the height of their glory and power, right? When they're, you know, leading nations or leading armies or leading expeditions, it's when they're unsure, when they're struggling, when they're looking for a foot, foothold, as you said, when they're suffering, uh, whether it's grief or, or injury or illness or failure, um, you really see who a person is. And we were talking about um, James Garfield, and he used to call it the bed of the sea. So when everything else is stripped away, this is who this person is. And you can see them for who they are. And, you know, after he was shot, 
Um, and he suffered for months. And as I said, he never, never should have died. But his doctors were, you know, inserting unsterilized fingers and instruments in him day after day. And he was developing this just unbelievable infection. Um, and the people around him who loved him, they said that he never changed. Even, I mean, he was experiencing just unimaginable pain and suffering. And, but he was always truly, truly who he had always been. You know, he was more concerned about the people around him than he was for his, for his own sake and his own suffering and his own life. And, um, and I think that's absolutely true. And, and that fascinates me. And, you know, I try to choose, um, I, I spend a lot, a lot of time um, thinking about the idea of a book before I commit to it, making sure, first of all, that I have enough primary source material, but also that it's going to interest me deeply and that it's going to be um, a, a sort of a focus story on a large canvas. Okay. It has to have some sort of larger importance in the world, mm -hmm. but I want, I love to dig in deep and see what I can reveal about this period in time, but about these, these main characters, but also the individuals around them. And I think that that, in my experience, happens best when somebody is struggling. Yeah. 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 I mean, you, really brought that story of Garfield to life. I mean, um, you felt like you were in the room with him while these, you know, medical procedures are happening and, you, you know, you just feel so bad for the guy. I mean, for months on end, <laughs> yeah. right? And and, yeah. uh, and his family and everyone who loved him and this nation, our young nation, who had put so much hope into him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's... Real tragedy. That, that is, that, that was actually one of the craziest things to me. It's like, thinking about him as a character and like how he was like this unifying force uh in the nation you know like post civil war and uh and just like how he was almost uh a re you know this kind of reluctant president right so you paint mm -hmm. a really great picture of him at the uh, convention he he was never trying to be president but <laughs> He was nominated. He's trying not to be yeah, a candidate. Yeah. He was nominated <laughs> right. by others. But you know what was kind of you know what was really interesting to me? Actually, it was um there's you mentioned something in there about the kind of tradition of the day was that um presidential candidates, they don't like campaign for themselves, right? So like right. he was nominated right. and then he went off back to his farm <laughs> to hang out for months or whatever, and other people yeah. do all the it's totally opposite than it is today, right? <laughs> I know. You're supposed to sit back and look wise, is what they said. Yeah. 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 And so people sometimes would come to him, you know, and he um, he spoke German. And so he actually gave one of the first election speeches in a foreign language, wow. you know, oh, in I the United States. That. Yeah. Because a group of, of German immigrants came to him and he, he spoke to them and German oh, from his front yeah. porch in Ohio. That's right. OK. Yeah. Now I remember that. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. Yeah. Can, can you maybe just comment just a little bit about his kind of academic polymath prowess. Absolutely. So he was um, incredibly poor. He was our last president born in a log cabin. His father died when he was two years old. He didn't have shoes until he was four years old in Ohio. And um, but he was just brilliant. And so his mother and his older brother um, worked and worked and scrimped and saved um, up. I think it was $11 that they saved up so he could go to college. But obviously, even at that time, that didn't pay for much. So he um, went to uh, what is today Hiram University in Ohio. And uh, his first year to help pay his tuition, he was a janitor and a carpenter. Um, but by his second year, well, he's a sophomore in college. He's a student himself. They made him a professor of literature, mathematics, and ancient languages. And uh, by the time he was 26, he was a university president. Um, and then when he was in the Senate, he wrote an original proof of the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> if you can imagine, think As okay, maybe do, a, right? a senator today who could do exactly. that. Um, but uh, to me, what was more impressive about Garfield, even than his mind, um, was his heart. You know, he he hit a runaway slave. He was instrumental in bringing about black suffrage. Um, when he gave his um, inaugural address. Um, there were just a, f a handful of people um, in the eastern portico with him, and one of them was Frederick Douglass, who had campaigned for him. And so he was just absolutely off the charts, brilliant, as I said, very brave. I mean, he, um, 
He was a hero in the Civil War, obviously, for the North. Um, and, uh, and, and just, uh, you know, so many people, I mean, you know, immigrants and pioneers and, um, you know, formerly enslaved people and former slave owners. I mean, it brought the country, his, his presidency brought the country to the, together for the first time um, since the Civil War. And for the first time, North and South thought, this is our president. I love that. I love that <laughs> unifying force that he, that he was. Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, the last thing I have to mention this just because my, uh, my, my father-in-law is a Williams College grad. Oh, right. Of was course. It, there was a Williams College connection with with. Yes, him. yeah. He went, so he went to Hiram, um, but it was sort of, it, it, he went to Williams kind of as graduate school, was kind of like finishing school or something. Um, yeah, and it was great. I, I love it because uh, there's this great letter that he writes home and he says, and he sort of quickly assessed everybody because he, you know, he was very modest, but he was ambitious in his own way and certainly intellectually ambitious. And he writes home and he was like, okay, I'm ahead of everybody but these three guys right now. He said, but by the end of the semester, I'm going to be at the top. <laughs> that's awesome. And he was, he was just brilliant. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, my wife comes from a long line of Williams College grads. Her, really? her dad and her da and her grandfather both went there, and she's got a bunch of cousins who all went there. They, she and her siblings all messed it up by going to Vanderbilt, but there's like <laughs> a long history. But it reminded me I need to to buy my uh, father in law a copy of your book. Oh, um, the, yeah, those are both great schools. Um, so back to this idea of suffering. Um, so we talked a little bit about you know Garfield in his medical trials and, and yet staying true to his character, like almost to like an unbelievable degree and being just incredibly calm and kind while he was facing like such unbelievable physical, you know, pain, trauma, et cetera. Um, how, how about some of your other characters? Because I think about, I just think about, you know, so a lot of the, the work that you've done is um, kind of 19th century, early 20th century. And I think I, I'm I love this period of time, and I'm always, I'm fascinated just to read so many. But I mean, there's so much interesting stuff going on. Parts of the world are still being discovered. There's new inventions, seemingly like every other year. It's just such a cool time in history. But then yeah. sometimes when I'm reading these really detailed descriptions like yours, I'm like, oh my gosh, life was just hard <laughs> though, right? So like, yes, always, like yes. what what else jumps out to you? when you think about some of your other books where you're like, oh my gosh, these guys like really dealt with some stuff. Yeah. Well, obviously these expeditions they went on, you know, Roosevelt's expedition in the Amazon in 1914. And then my first book and then my last book, um, this uh, expedition into East Africa to find the source of the Nile um, in uh, the 1880s. And uh yeah, it, I, I mean, it's one of these things you think, uh, I'm so glad I'm just reading about this and not there. You know, I, I always hope to try to make people feel like they're there, you know, and feel really uncomfortable and scared. Um, but, um, but think, oh, I'm not, though. I'm sitting at home in my armchair. So just to give some examples, um, so from uh, River of the Gods um, on these expeditions, I think one of the things people have to kind of wrap their minds around are how long these trips yeah, took, yeah. you know, because they would travel thousands of miles into completely unmapped territory or unmapped for Europeans. They had no idea there hadn't been other Europeans in much of this area, and they just had no idea what they're going to experience. And they go through you know, like really every habitat you can imagine. They're going through jungle. They're going through desert. They're going through plains. I mean, it's just... Um, and you can imagine the diseases that come along with it. You know, um, the main characters in this story are Richard Burton and John Hanning Speak. And both men, you know, they had horrible eye infections where they couldn't see for months That's when they're crazy. trying to, yeah. you know. It's crazy. Walk, and, they're, and this yeah. is by foot. You know, they have some donkeys, but the donkeys had to carry all these supplies that they had to bring with them because they couldn't count on being able to you know, kill anything or or buy supplies. Sometimes they could, but most of the time they had to feed themselves. And so, um, yeah, they had these eye infections, so they were blinded. Um, Burton had such severe malaria that he was paralyzed for almost a year. I mean, they had to, he couldn't walk. That's they insane. had to carry him. He was a big guy. He couldn't even use his hands. And he, you know, he was this incredible scholar and he 
incredible researcher and he was always taking notes and stuff and he couldn't use his hands for a long time. Um, poor, um, poor speak. He, um, one night he's in his tent and there's a storm and the storm knocks down his tent. So to re-erect it, he lights a candle, which was a, just a horrible idea because it attracts this horde of beetles. So there are hundreds of beetles in this, in this tent with him and he's flailing around trying to get rid of them. And finally, he just gives up out of exhaustion and he lays down and he pretty soon feels a beetle crawling into his ear and it starts digging into his ear, burrowing deeper and deeper and he, he can't get it out. So he tries, you know, pouring oil in it. He tries salt, butter. And finally, out of desperation, he takes a pen knife and he stabs himself <laughs> in the ear and he does kill oh, the gruesome. beetle. But <laughs> but he deafens himself in that ear for oh the rest of his gosh. life. And like and for weeks afterwards, there's little bits of the beetle coming out in his earwax, you know, like a leg and a wing. And <laughs> he's got these horrible boils down. And, you know, they have this these diseases that they had no idea yeah. what they were. And then they're he's literally like, you know, all completely twisted up and barking and, you know, frothing in the mouth. And I mean, <laughs> it is a miserable. It was miserable. I mean, yes, that is a <laughs> that is a little window into the type of picture that you can paint. I feel like, uh, and and by the way, Candace's books are not like full of gruesome, gory details, even though she just described that in a way that might scare you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just crazy, right? I mean, life was just hard. I mean, granted, hard. these characters that you're um, you know telling the stories of are doing these things that are probably you know. Uh, extraordinary um, in terms of like trying to, you know, cross massive parts of the African continent or, you know, they're doing extraordinary things, but it is just a reminder that of where medicine was at that time. You know, we yeah. weren't super advanced in terms of, tr you know, knowing how diseases were passed or treating diseases and, you know, you know, just things that are considered like basic medicine, I guess, today. We just, mm -hmm. these guys just didn't have it. And so, I feel, I don't know if this would be a right way to say it or not, but like, it feels to me like suffering was more a part of their lives and. Absolutely. And, and, and death, you know, I mean, people died from things that today, you know, you, you wouldn't even go into the hospital for. Yeah. So, I absolutely. mean, that's another theme too. Yeah. And think, thinking about, um, <clears throat> thinking about especially children, right. I, I think back mm. to Theodore Roosevelt and all the trials and tribulations of, of his family early on. Um, it's crazy stuff. So, um, okay. So thinking about, you know, you, you mentioned that you were, uh, kind of having to remind yourself and happy that you were sitting here in your armchair and not <laughs> the one experiencing all this. Um, but, but I guess, you know, I'm curious as you think about, you know, I, I, I imagine as you work on these books, you know, you see parts of yourself or parts of other people, you know, in different characters. Um, so tell me a little bit about, um, you know, how, how that's impacted you, or I guess another way to put it is I'm curious if, if you feel like throughout your own life, you've had any big tests that have really, um, and maybe this is a lofty way to put it, but, but I would say t taught you something about your own character. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I'm 55 years old. Not many people get to 55 without having some trials and tribulations and some loss. Um, you know, I, um, I, we've had a lot of cancer in our family. I, I lost a sister mm. um, to metastatic breast cancer. <clears throat> and I had a child who was born with um, neuroblastoma. And, um, and it was interesting because I was um, finishing up uh, my first book, um, River of the Doubt, at that time. And, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I think like most people who set out to write a book, the first time you think, I don't know if I can do it, mm -hmm. you know, um, it sounds cool, but it sounds really, really hard. Um, and I've been working on it for many years. I had a an, another child. She was um, just about to turn three years old. And I was working on my final proofs of that book. And I was expecting my second daughter. And um, I got a call one day. And from my from my doctor, and she said, you know, we saw something in the last sonogram. We want you to come in and just take a closer look. And I did, and it turned out that the baby had a tumor. Mm. And um, 
And I had to have her that day. It was my other daughter's third birthday. Wow. How early was that that you had to give birth? <laughs> well, fortunately, she was just about three weeks away okay. from her due date. Okay. So her lungs had developed. Yeah. She, she, was, she was big enough um, to have her. So that was a real gift. Um, anyway, so we, you know, emergency C-section and she's in the hospital and they find out that it's, it's malignant and it's neuroblastoma. Wow. And it's stage four, and it's really serious. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, we're terrified. Yeah. Obviously, you have a child, you can imagine. And um, I remember very clearly, so, and I've just had the C-section, and I had to, you know, and she's at a different hospital. So I'm over at Children's Mercy with her in the middle of the night. And, you know, she's hooked up to all these machines, these beeping lights, and I'm trying to go through my proofs of this, my first book. And um, thank God my editor was amazing. I mean, he didn't even know I was pregnant because I thought, oh, it's not a big deal. He just, you know, <laughs> I'll have the baby. I'll be fine. Um, <clears throat> but I had to call him and say, well, you're going to have to buy me a little bit more time. Um, but uh, he was really, really great about it. Um, but I remember reading this and I, I saw this story in a completely different way than I had in all those years I worked on it. You know, I came from National Geographic. so. I saw this as a story of adventure and survival mm. and natural history and all those things. Um, but really, this was about Theodore Roosevelt and his son. You know, this is about a man trying to save his son mm. from this horrible ordeal. You know, they are, they're in the middle of nowhere and they're on this, this river that's completely unmapped and they're starving and they, there are these, um, Native people, the Cinta Larga, who live there, they don't know who they are. And the Cinta Larga don't know these people either, right? They're, they've certainly not, you know, invited them into their territory. Um, and they could kill them at any moment. They're losing canoe after canoe. It's basically every man for himself. And Roosevelt is so sick that he thinks he's going to be a danger to the other men. And he always took with him a lethal dose of morphine on any of his trips because he didn't want to endanger the lives of the other men if anything happened to him. And he decides that he, and he pulls his son and his, uh, this American naturalist who was with him, he pulls him into the tent and he says, hey, look, I can't go on. I'll stay here. You guys get out. And the only reason he didn't, and the only reason Theodore Roosevelt didn't die in the middle of the Amazon is that his son refused to let him die and said, no, I'm going to take you out with me. And Roosevelt realized the best way to save his son was to let his son save him because it would keep, I mean, Kermit was going to do, Kermit, his son, was going to do everything he could to get his father out alive, which meant he would get himself out alive and probably the rest of the men with him. And that's what happened. And, um, and so I, again, I'm sitting in this hospital room with my baby who's fighting for her life and we're fighting. And I just see it in this completely different way about this is a, a father's love for his child, you know, and it's in a way that I never would have understood it if I hadn't been going through, you know, my my own crisis. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing uh, description you just gave. And, and and how did it how did everything pan out with your daughter, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, we are unbelievably lucky. So she had eight rounds of chemo before she turned two years mm -hmm. old wow. and, um, and you know, has had a, a life of, you know, a lot of trips to the doctor, a lot of MRIs and things. But she, she's just about to graduate from high school and you would never know it. She's just the picture of health. So, you know, the if there's anything I'm truly, deeply grateful for in this world, it's what you said. It's modern medicine. It's research scientists. It's doctors. It's nurses. Um, you know, it's it's extraordinary how far we've come. And um, one of the treatments that saved her life, without question, um, they didn't have just 10 years earlier. So we wow. we would have lost her no just 10 years earlier if she had been born 10 years earlier. And um you know, sadly, there are a lot of kids out there who's who still are dying uh, from cancer. And but but because it's a smaller group mm -hmm. than um, adults who have cancer, um, there's just not as much research going into um, pharmaceutical treatment for them. Mm -hmm. And there's not enough support, government support for um, children's cancer research as well. So um, that's uh, that's some place we're really falling behind. Yeah. But she's 
just, you know, perfect specimen, That's... extremely healthy. And she's had no bad side effects from the, I mean, she had some really, really toxic chemo yeah. at a time when, you know, everything's growing, right? You, it's all these, you know, uh, chemo attacks, fast growing cells, and there's nothing faster than a baby. <laughs> you know, everything's growing. And um, no, she's, uh, she's, we're just beyond, beyond fortunate. Wow. That's amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. I think um, sure. uh, <clears throat> it's, it's really cool to hear how that also put your own book into a different light, like right at the finish mm -hmm. line um, as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, when, when you're, when you have, when it's the health of your child that is involved, it can be all consuming. So we, we had something with my son about almost a year ago now where he, uh, he basically had some seizures and oh like very, like really scared, like 11 year old kid, yeah. like totally scared us. And um, had several episodes where we had no idea what was going on. If you've ever seen a seizure in person, they're very scary, especially if you're no, totally not expecting it and stuff like that. And so we, we had to, uh, you know, spend a bunch of time in hospitals with doctors and all that kind of stuff and figuring out that he's got um, childhood epilepsy, which is has a pretty good so prognosis. Sorry. Well, it's, he's got a pretty good, good. good prognosis in that a lot of good. kids like outgrow it by the time they get to their teens. Um, mm -hmm. But we spent the last Good. year kind of, you know, working through that and figuring that out and all mm -hmm. that. But one of the, it's kind of interesting to like, for, for me, like there's been a couple of times in my life when like tragedy has struck and then like, but like, it's almost weirdly led to like a moment of like clarity or mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's the best way to describe it, but for, for him actually, uh, for whatever reason, right? Because when I was processing all this this past summer, um, a lot of the I like to write usually to process my own feelings. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I wrote a couple newsletter articles at that time. And uh, the thing that really came to my mind was actually Teddy Roosevelt and his struggles as a child. Like he was such mm -hmm. a sickly kid and they thought he was going to die multiple times. And then right. like, Lo and behold, he ends up becoming like this, you know, almost like caricature of like strength, right? And Party health, yes. right? <laughs> and so like, um, and I've mentioned this to my son, you know, multiple times and I probably, you know, will encourage him to read more about characters from history like like Teddy Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. But I've mentioned it to him um, that, you know, a lot of times when people have these challenges when they're kids, they almost end up turning into their these like superpowers for them. So right. I bet you're going to be right. this much stronger, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my um, daughter is in college now and she's working on her junior paper and it's about, she's an anthropology major and it's about um, disability where, where disability becomes a strength. It actually becomes an advantage. Mm. And she gives several fascinating examples through history. And one is Harriet Tubman. Because Harriet Tubman, I guess, had narcolepsy. Mm. As, and it came out of an injury. Someone, you know, she was enslaved and someone hit her <clears throat> on the head. And she developed narcolepsy. Um, but because of that, she was completely dismissed. People were like, oh, she's damaged goods. We don't have to worry about her. She's not going to try to escape or anything, much less help, you know, how countless other people escape. And so it became this advantage for her. Mm. And I think absolutely it can. And especially, I think, when it's something that you experience when you're a child, you know, and it does shape you. I mean, my daughter, you know, has always known that she's a cancer survivor. She has a huge scar all the way across her stomach that she hates when she wears a bikini now, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it's, you know, it's it's her war wound, yeah. right? Um, you know, it, it, I, I admire what she's accomplished and she doesn't remember it. But she's got this secret strength, yeah. right? She knows just that she overcame something, and and it does it does give you a deep strength, and your your son will absolutely have that too. And what terrified you and your wife, and you'll be traumatized <laughs> for the rest of your mm -hmm. life um, with that, um, will be this absolutely this strength yeah. in in him. That's cool. I like the way you put that secret strength. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about your. Um, writing process. So I've heard you say before that writing book is a 
basically a five-year process for you. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty daunting uh, for a lot of people to hear, for me to hear. Uh, it, so, but um, <laughs> let's talk about what that looks like. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to hear about, you know, everything from idea stage to like what, what happens with like the seed of an idea and how it gets planted, maybe through mm -hmm. all the way through the process to this book is published and now I'm like promoting it. What does that five years look like? Well, as I said earlier, um, to me, the most important part of the process is the idea. And um, I've had a lot of ideas that, um, you know, I spend time on and I finally have to walk away from. In fact, I've had two ideas that I was really, really in love with. And I spent a year on each oh, wow. of them separately no and ended up walking away from um it ripped my heart out but it was the right thing can it at least um, become like an uh, atlantic article or something like that or? <laughs> yeah maybe i know i actually have thought of that but it's um you know just finding time then to yeah, write yeah, something yeah. else but um <clears throat> so what i'm looking for in an idea um uh, of course you know a great central story and as i said a story that I can dig in deeply and it can be pretty focused, but it has to have importance on a larger scale. So the um, example is um, Winston Churchill. You know, this is this, you know, just a, a couple of just covers a couple of months in his life when he was a very young man. But it not only launched his political career, you don't only see the same Winston Churchill that came to the fore 40 years later, right? All those qualities, his determination, his resourcefulness, his creativity, his all of those things, his audacity, those you see in this very young man, you can see them all very clearly in this moment. But this was also the beginning of modern warfare. You know, this was um, the first guerrilla fighting, some of the first concentration camps. And it really, um, it changed, completely changed the British um, army and prepared them for World mm -hmm. War I. So all those things um, are really, really important then in choosing a book. Um, the most important thing is the primary source material. So I think for, you know, obviously for any nonfiction, but especially for narrative nonfiction, you have to be a drowning in letters and diaries and newspaper accounts. I mean, with Garfield, since it was the shooting of a president and he lived for several months, um, I mean, the New York Times coverage alone took me months to go through. I mean, you you sort of at so, some point, you know, it's it's an embarrassment of riches, but you're like, oh, my God, <laughs> I'm never going to get through all. Right. And it was, yeah, it was really a rich um, period in journalism, you know, and they really told the story from every angle. Um, and it was just fascinating reading, but it gives you, um, you know, all those little details that you hope bring it to life that I hope make people feel like they're actually there. And it also gives you dialogue. You know, a lot of times people will say, how can you have dialogue? How do you know that they said this? Well, they talked about it They in their letters, right? They wrote about it, you know, as we would today, maybe in a text or email to your friends, like I said this to him and he said this to me. And so I can use that as, as a dialogue and people also in their diaries and things like that. So it's just, you, it has to, you just have to, again, be just drowning in all of this, um, source material. Um, and so, and I love to be able to, if I can, to be able to go where the story played out. And I've been really lucky. I've been able to do that with each of my books. Obviously for Garfield, that was just, you know, <laughs> Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Mm -hmm. and, and Ohio when he was growing up. But, you know, I, I went to the Amazon. I went to the River of Doubt, which is still extremely remote. You know, people say, oh, I've been to the Amazon, you know, in Manaus or something like this. No. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had to rent my own plane, hire a pilot, fly for hours into, uh, you know, just completely unbroken jungle from wow. horizon to horizon to try to reach this river. Um, I went to where um, Winston Churchill was captured in South Africa, and they still have, I went, the um, building where he was kept as a POW, um, it, was a, it was a school in Pretoria, and they turned it into this um, POW camp, and it's now a public library. Oh, cool. But, you know, I went there. The room where he was kept, it has a trap door on the floor where they thought about tunneling their way out. So I stood in that. Wow. They um, have uh, these men. So the, it was an officer's camp. And so they, for some reason, they let them, um, they are incredibly trained, well-trained cartographers, and they let them draw a map of South Africa sort of charting the course of the war wow. on the wall. Wow. And it's still there. Wow. Kind of covered in plexiglass. 
Um, he hid um, when after he escaped. He hid in this um, coal mine shaft for three days with these white rats. The 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 colliery is gone, but the shaft is still there. Um, and he ended up in Mozambique, which is in Portuguese East Africa. That's how he um, was finally saved. Um, he went to the um, British Consul there, and um, that building's still there. Um, so all of those things in East Africa, I was in Zanzibar. I was all the way, and you know, all I I, you know, I followed the course of this of this expedition and the search for the source of the wow. Nile from the coast of East Africa all the way west and in and Tanzania, and then up into Uganda uh, to the Nyanza Lake Victoria. So I've been able to do all of these things and sort of have my own adventures, but. With modern medicine, yes. with, mm -hmm. you know, uh, GPS, with satellite phones, if I was really far in, um, and sometimes with, you know, planes and things like that. Um, so instead of spending years, I would spend a month. Um, but it's absolutely fascinating, and it's oh, by far my favorite part of the job. Yeah. But you're, even though you're there with all these modern amenities, you're still able to see a place, smell it, touch it, mm -hmm. hear the noises, especially I imagine out in the Amazon or in, you know, remote parts of Africa where, you know, it it's probably pretty similar in a lot of ways to what existed, you know, a hundred years ago or whatever it was. Um, and I think a lot of that comes through in your writing when you vi really vividly describe the landscapes and the you know, just the whole environment around these people. Um, so it's clear to me that you've got the expertise you know what you're talking <laughs> about. Um, there, there was a story I heard you tell. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't mind um, you recounting it um, if you're willing, um, which is on a research trip to Washington, D.C. to do your work on President Garfield. Um, you were, uh, I think, doing some work in, I don't know if it was Library of Con Congress or somewhere else, but go going through um, some old artifacts and things like that. And you opened up an envelope and had a surprising discovery. Would you mind That's recounting right. that one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons I do my own research, not just, you know, when I go to places, but all the archival research, because you never know what you're going to find. So you obviously start out knowing, okay, I know there are certain letters and things that I need to have, but I don't know what else I'm going to find. And you can't really tell somebody else, like, you know, to look for that, or if you happen to see that, you just don't know. So, um, yeah, so Garfield's papers in the Library of Congress and the Presidential Papers, which is in the Madison Building, and you know, it's 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 James Garfield. I mean, nobody had looked at his papers since he died in 1881, and they um, and they donated them there. And uh, and um, it, even though he was president for a short time, he had been Congress for almost 18 years. So all of his papers are there and all the other characters, you know, Chester Arthur and Roscoe Conkling and even Lucretia, his wife. So I was there for many weeks um, going through all of these things. And, um, you know, this is the Library of Congress. These are our national treasures. So they have a lot of rules that um, you have to and you should follow. And so you can have one cart next to you. I think you can have maybe like five bins on that cart full of these art these documents and you can only have one bin on the table at a time and you have to take one, one item out of that bin at a time so and they they watch you and so I'm a rule follower I was really careful um, but I had been through so many papers and yeah I pulled out this envelope I didn't know what it was um, the front of it's facing the desk so I open it up and all this hair falls out and there's this hair all over my desk and I turn the envelope over and handwritten on the front and his best friend's handwriting was clipped from President Garfield's head on his deathbed. And I'm like, crap. And I'm, <laughs> you know, trying to blow it back into the envelope. And I'm thinking, you know, they're going to throw me out of here. Oh my my career's over. I'll never be allowed back into the Library of Congress. Um, but at the same time, I was sort of panicking. I was so struck by it was what we were talking about earlier about how some of these people start to become, start to seem mythical, right? Yeah. And but I was like, oh, you know, this this looked like I could have clipped it from my child's head yesterday. This hair, wow. this sort of light brown hair, and you just like, this was a real human being. You know, he was forty nine years old. He had a family who loved him. He had this young country who 
which that loved him. He had so much life ahead of him and so much to give. And and this never should have happened. And the and the additional tragedy on top of his death was that he was then forgotten. Mm. And the people they knew it at the time. They knew that this was going to happen. They knew, you know, here was a president they loved and they were excited about and he was going to do so much good for our country. And they knew he's going to be forgotten. And and he was. Mm. And so it's just this incredibly powerful reminder. If, if, if you have the audacity or you think you can tell somebody else's story, you better do everything you can to try to get it right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that moment has stayed with me forever. Isn't that so cool that like you do all, you are probably spending months or years doing all this research, getting to know this guy and you feel like you truly knew him and had a real sense of who he was and his family and his character and all this kind of stuff. And then and then you literally are like holding in your fingertips a piece of him, like his, <laughs> his DNA. Hair. Like his hair. that's right. crazy. Right. You know? Another quick moment, I'll just tell you another quick story. So when I started doing the research, I went to the um, Museum of Health and Medicine, which is then in Walter Reed. And they have um, all like they, they have his, the original autopsy results from him. They have it's so weird. They had at that time. Um, some pieces of Guiteau, the assassin, yeah. you know, they had, uh, they have a jar with parts of his brain in it, you know, and they have like a femur and a wrist bone in the same drawer as also parts of John Wilkes Booth. So it was like the assassin's drawer. It was really bizarre. Was so but weird. they also have a piece of Garfield's spine um, that was used during the trial. And it shows there's this like red plastic pin showing where the bullet went through. It didn't hit his spinal cord, but it went through the column. And so they have it. And I remember when I was first doing the research thinking, wow, that's really interesting that we have this historical artifact. Well, fast forward four years, the book comes out and um, All Things Considered wanted to interview me about it. Um, And it's obviously radio, but they're like, let's go there anyway. Mm -hmm. To where they have you know this spine and you can talk about it and well by then walter reed had closed down and um this museum had moved to this new building and it's this kind of you know fancy modern new kind of sterile building um and we were taken into this um just this it looked like a conference room where you go for like a business meeting or something like that so we're, we're taken in there while they go to get the piece of spine and I'm, we're just talking and whatever, and the door opens, and they wheel in this cart with this piece of spine. It's in this kind of, you know, uh, you know, contained, protected space. And I saw it, and I thought, uh, I'm going to cry. I'm going to start crying because, and I, how am I going to talk about it? Because now I know him. I know him now. Mm-hmm. It's been years of my life mm-hmm. spent trying to understand him. And he was an incredibly good person. And this never should have happened. This unbelievable tragedy. And I, I care about him now. And, and this isn't just an interesting historical artifact. You know, this is a tragedy set before me. It'd be like, you know, your beloved uncle or something. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a piece of him, you know. And, um, and I, was, I was really surprised by that. I did not expect it at all, the emotions that I felt. But, yeah, you... you you spend so much time with these people, you come to, you, you're human, you know, you try to be objective and you try to set things out and let the reader decide for him or herself, herself how they feel about these characters. But you can't help but develop a feeling about them yourself. And, um, and of all the people I've written about, I admire James Garfield the most. And he reminds me of my father, you know, just a good, decent, modest, smart kind human being and um and it yeah I, I really it was an emotional moment for me yeah 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 it's 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 amazing the you know the, these physical artifacts and how they can be a real connection to these stories or these parts in history because i think as you were kind of alluding to i think there's a tendency for folks to say oh this is history this is so long ago i can't even like you know wrap my brain around it how this is really connected to me but when you start mm-hmm. to really think about it this wasn't that long ago i mean we're talking like a couple of generations you know removed and right. um uh and that that there is just something about those those physical 
things, uh, do you know, whether they be documents in, you know, someone's handwriting or even like you said, um, you know, bones and, and things like that, that really just make it real. So I, I hope there's a long history ahead for, for folks who curate this type of stuff and keep yes. it, keep it safe and, uh, and, and all yeah, that. We're, we're, yeah, we all owe them a great debt of gratitude and also homes, you know, when they preserve somebody's home, like mm. with Garfield, you know, the lawn field, they ended up calling it, um, where he raised his children and he loved it so much. And you can go there and it's still 80% what he, you know, true original to when he lived there. And, um, and you really get a sense of him just by going to his home. Yeah. That's super cool. So in your five-year process, you're, you're going on these amazing Ooh. research trips. You are, you know, pouring through, um, all these primary, um, source materials, journals and newspaper articles and what have you. I'm kind of starting to think twice about now what I'm putting on Twitter. If somebody, <laughs> I, guess, I guess that would be, um. <laughs> uh, pretty good luck uh, if somebody was writing a biography of me someday. But um, yeah, but uh, but any, it's all fair game. Yeah, it's all fair game. But uh, it, so so you get all of your material, you you do your research, and then um, is it true that your outlining process is basically like a year long, or mm -hmm. has has been so far? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, the outlining is everything mm -hmm. to me. I I I, I know there are a lot of. Um, excellent, excellent writers of nonfiction who don't outline. Um, and I admire that. And it seems like a mystery to me because I, I just can't imagine um, writing without outlining first, especially because these are very, very complicated stories. And also, you know, you if you read a, uh, a work of nonfiction that you really like, um, and it seems like, oh, this, of course, this is how you would have to tell it, right? And this is how you would start. And there's really no other way. And there, when you're, there are a million different ways you can tell that story, a million different ways you can start it and approach it and end it, you know. And so you really have to think about those things. And also with narrative nonfiction, I really want tension, you know. I want you to want to turn the page. I want those cliffhangers. I want you to worry about things, you know. Um, I want foreshadowing. And you can have it. And it's all absolutely true. You're, I'm not messing with the chronology. I'm not messing with history. Um, but it's but you have to think about it. It's the way you tell you choose to tell the story. So, um, for example, uh, with um, with with um, Theodore Roosevelt's expedition, there's this guy on in the expedition who ends up murdering somebody later on. And um, when I'm doing the research, I realize at some point I was reading, I think it was George Cherry, the ornithologist who went with him, his, his, um, his diary is kept at the American Museum of Natural History. And he talks about at one point that he, this guy had threatened somebody with a knife. He had gotten angry and kind of, you know, and it was just like one sentence, but I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to say that. I'm going to talk about that. So you're like, Oh, the reader is like, I'm going to keep my eye on that guy. He's going to be trouble. And he does a couple of, he steals food and just, you know, he's, and he's always kind of grumpy and pouty. And you're like, this guy is going to be trouble. So I'm keeping my eye on him. So that's foreshadowing. All those things absolutely happen. I'm not, obviously would never put something in that didn't happen, but you have to think about it ahead of time. You can't just say, oh, he killed somebody, you know, and uh, earlier he did this and right, this and this, right, you know, right. no, you want to, you know sort of sprinkle that mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. so the person's watching and worrying. And it, it's the same thing with Garfield, the guy who is his assassin. I actually start, the 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 book begins with this guy, Guteau, on this steamship, right? And he's in the middle of the night and it crashes into another steamship. And, he, and all these people die and he is saved. And he thinks, okay, God saved me for a special purpose, mm -hmm. right? What is that purpose? Well, it turns out he thinks that God wants him to kill the president, right? He, and so, but, but so Garfield, he, so I'm, I'm going back and forth between this guy's life and he's, he's getting crazier and crazier and doing all these crazy things. And here's Garfield upstanding, true, doing all the right things and just moving through life. And, and as a reader, I want you to feel like, turn around, turn around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's this guy who's coming up behind yeah. you. Watch out, right? Right. And so you have that tension, but you've got to think about it ahead of time. You can't just say, 
can't just throw it all at the, at the same time. You've got to plan it, yeah. right? How you're going to tell it. And the only way to do that, that I know of, is to outline. And so, yeah, I spend a year, at least a year, uh, working on the outline. There's so many <laughs> little moments from your books that are like <laughs> coming to mind right now. Like I was just thinking about um, like the way that you start with Guto Guto on that uh, on that boat. Like was reminding mm -hmm. me of a tribute. I I think I saw you wrote to David McCullough. It's like he always tried to have his characters like moving in movement. Yes. At the beginning, begin with the man that, on the move. I, I don't know if you had that in mind <laughs> when you started the book that way, but that just occurred to me. And then the other random thought that just occurred to me was um, how easy it was for people to get into the White House back then. There was like no Secret <laughs> Service. You could just I go know. in and expect and hang around for a long time and expect that somebody, maybe the president or the secretary of state would see you, right? After a presidential assassination, 16 years after Lincoln had been killed. Mm. So it's like, hey, people, you know, your your presidents are in danger, yeah. possibly. So yes. protect them. But wild. they didn't. Um, yeah. Okay. And then you write the book. Uh, and yeah. so, like, <laughs> it, it, this is a random question for you, but I was curious. Like, if, if it's, do you ever feel like you get to the time when, when you're actually putting pen to paper and writing the book and you're like, oh gosh, I haven't written in a while. Or do you, are you writing other stuff? Like, <laughs> yes. does your writing muscle get atrophied because this yes. process is so long? Yes. The answer is yes. It gets rusty. It does. And so that's why I appreciate opportunities. I mean, I, I, I deeply appreciate the opportunity to write that tribute about Dave McCullough because like you, he's absolutely one of my heroes. Um, and so that was an incredible honor, but it was a chance to write. Yeah. So, so again, if it takes, it takes me five years, roughly, um, and it's only the last year mm -hmm. that I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it definitely does get rusty. And, um, and I, yeah, I always worry like, oh yeah, how does this work again? Yeah. It's, it, you're using those different parts of your mind, but I do always thank myself for having this outline. So at least I'm not just, you know, looking at, you know, my blank screen on my computer and saying, okay, how do I start this thing? Yeah, you know, yeah. I've already got, and even when I'm outlining, you know, sometimes if something will occur to me that I think, oh, that might work. I, it's a little bit of writing involved in it too. It's mostly just like, <laughs> you know, putting in, this is my evidence for this. And, but also one more thing about outlining is that you can move things around so easily, mm -hmm. right? You can see it and you can move it. Where when you, once you start writing, you're worrying about things like word choice and rhythm and pacing and all those kind of, you know, trying to make it beautiful mm -hmm. if you can, right? And it's and then if you like realize, oh crap, yeah, that actually belongs somewhere else. I don't want to ruin mm -hmm. my beautiful. <laughs> I know, <laughs> right? yes. This is so good. I don't want to. Um, and so when you it's just much, much easier to move things around because you don't want to get wedded to something just because you like the way it sounds and the way it looks. Um, because what matters the most, the idea and then the structure, the bones of the story when you're writing a book or I think writing an article even, it's the bones of it. It has to make sense. And as I always tell my kids, you know, when you're writing clarity, clarity, clarity above all else, mm -hmm. you know, answer those questions who, what, where, how, all the, those, you know, people think, oh, you don't really need that because it's art and everything. No, the reader needs to know, where am I? Who is this person? Why are we here? What's going on? You know, and um, you have to have topic sentences. You have to know, even if your thesis isn't just laid out, you have to know, like, what's the point? You know, so you have to answer all of those questions yourself. So your, so your reader isn't, confused yeah. and trying to answer them themselves. That, that's great advice. I, I, I just spoke with uh, the author um, and technologist, Kevin Kelly, and he just came out with a new book called uh, Excellent Advice for Living, which is like a little oh. book oh, about these little nuggets of advice from his yeah. 70 plus years on earth. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we, we were talking about exactly this idea um, of sort of uh, for for the type of work he does. And, and I think for most things that people write, um, a good rule is sort of clear over clever. And I like his yes, title of his book yes. is Excellent Advice for Living. I'm like, yes. I like that you didn't try to like get, don't take this the wrong way, but I like that you didn't like to try, try to get too clever with that. Like that's, this is exactly yeah. what this book is about. And, yes. and the title is very clear. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, well, I could ask you questions on your routine probably for like three hours. So I'm going <laughs> to, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. But like, I, I, you know, 
I could, I could ask you questions about what kind of coffee you're drinking during this, <laughs> what kind of, how many computer screens you got up. I, there's a cool little- I'm a green tea girl. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. There's a cool little video on your website that uh, sh kind of shows you in your workspace, assuming that's still your workspace, and it's got like three mm -hmm. computer screens, and it's got it yeah. books everywhere, primary source material <laughs> everywhere. I was like, oh, that's cool. It's like a little window into her workspace. But, um, but in the interest of time, um, so I want to ask you just about actually kind of related to what we were just talking about, um, some advice maybe for aspiring, aspiring writers, mm -hmm. um, whether they're, you know, folks in middle age or maybe even kids. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I've listened to you talk about your own childhood um, on different interviews that you've given, and it sounds like you had a really, you know, happy childhood. You were a um, really loving family and, you mm -hmm. know, grew up in the, the Midwest and you are describe yourself, I think, as a library kid. You could walk to the yes. library and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. And so right. it sounds like um, there was a real love of reading and writing that was kind of nurtured in you at a young age. Mm -hmm. um, and I think selfishly as a parent, um, I look, you know, I have three children and they're, they're wow. probably various levels of interest, you know, and they 11 year old boy is kind of not always been a great reader, but like one, mm -hmm. one practice we started recently was reading each other articles from ESPN at night because oh, he just loves it. Yes. And so like it lights him up. Brilliant. Um, my daughter, the middle child, she is, um, I almost like when I hear you describing your uh, childhood, I, I, I almost like see my daughter, like she's Mm. She's this very like calm, serene little girl, but like a great reader. She loves diving into stories and read, reads all the Harry Potter books and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I'd like to, and then I've got a three-year-old who's just a bull in a china shop <laughs> who we don't know yet, but we read to him every night. <laughs> right. But, um, but, uh, but anyways, I, you know, from your experience growing up yourself, but also raising kids who it sounds like are doing very well, what, what would you say to kind of nurture that love for, for reading and writing? Well, I think it's exactly what you're doing. I have three kids as well, and it's the same. My my oldest um, just has always loved books. He's just a little book nerd, just like I am. And um, and so it, you know, the the difficulty we we had to have a family rule is like um, no no reading when you're walking because she, you know, <laughs> she, she was going to die. I mean, she wasn't going <laughs> to. You know, she Most people are the, on the cell phones these days doing yeah, that. But, I know, I know, yeah. but literally nose in a book constantly. Wow. Um, and, um, but my, 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 and then my youngest, he, he loves to read too, but it, but it's finding what they love, yeah. right? Finding, but my middle child, she was the challenge for me. She, um, I just couldn't find the right thing. And she, she was like one of these, you know, princess girls, mm -hmm. you know, and I used to, I, I will admit, I used to judge other parents whose daughters were like, you know, dressed like a princess completely mm -hmm. every single day. And was like, oh, those, those parents must be, you know putting those children in those dresses and stuff because my oldest daughter didn't. She yep, never did yep. any of that. But along comes Petra, who, you know, she's just, that's who she is. You know, she constantly, every day she wore a crown. <laughs> and so I'm trying to find books about princesses or books about fairies or whatever. And she just didn't like them. And um, I think I, I, I was looking for the subject and not just good writing, right? Mm. They just weren't good. They weren't told well. Mm. They were good stories. Mm. And she finally found um, the Babysitter Club books. Oh, which my you daughter's know, reading those right now. She loves really? them. Really? Yes. Oh, my gosh. And there are like 150 yeah, of them yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. And there's all these spinoffs she... of it. And everything. My yeah. daughter was explaining to me. She's like, oh, this is uh, somebody's little sister. She's in the main one. And this is uh, this yeah, whole series yeah, exactly. about the little sister. Right. <laughs> I know. It's brilliant. And they're like, um, now there are graphic novel yep. versions of them and all those kinds of things. And. And she actually got to meet, I think it's Anne Martin who wrote them, oh. and she actually got to meet her at the um, Library of Congress's big um, book festival a couple of years ago. Oh, and cool. the line was like out the door. Like she had a longer line waiting to sign books than anybody, wow. any other author um, because there's so many kids who just love her yeah. books. But also the Harry Potter things, they did that. The books did that for my nephew who never, it, he just did not like to read and it was Harry Potter. And now he reads everything. Right. And so it's opening that door. And I say the same thing about history. I say the same thing about poetry. What I said about Garfield, you know, if you think history is boring, if you think there's no poetry that you would like, you just haven't found 
your kind of history. You just haven't found your kind of poetry. Mm -hmm. You're wrong. You just haven't found your kind of thing. And I've had so many people come up to me and it's just such a wonderful thing to hear where they think, I thought history was boring. I thought I would never like history until I read you or Eric Larson or Laura Hillenbrand, whoever it might be, um, just falling in love with history. But you've got to find. And so like with kids, it's just finding what they love. And if it's, you know, if it's sports or if it's graphic novels are wonderful. Yeah. They're such a great thing or comic books or anything, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's like they don't have to feel bad, like, oh, I'm not reading War and Peace at 12, <laughs> mm -hmm, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, well, but maybe you'll get there, you yeah. know? And that, I also always say that about you know, narrative nonfiction or sort of layman's history. It's like what I hope is that they'll, you know, read one of my books or Eric Larson's or somebody and think, oh, I want to know more about that and then go a deeper dive and maybe get to some of the more academic histories and find that they're really, really fascinating, actually. Yeah. yeah, great. I love that. So find great writing and great storytelling in an area yeah, that stories. they're somewhat Story interested story. in. And yeah, yeah, I think that's great. That's great advice. I'm glad <laughs> to hear you say that about graphic novels, too, because um, my kids love those. And yes, mine, too. Yeah, they're terrific. I feel it's like, yeah, like whatever you can, whatever book you can have in their hands that they're going to devour is probably the right is probably the right thing. Um, yeah. And I am I hate the judgy, you know, the judgy readers. Like also people like, and I listen to books too. Mm -hmm. I, I listen all the time Same. when I drive, I listen yep. to books. And there are people, you know, who feel very, very strongly that that is not mm. reading. I'm sorry. I think it's reading, you know. I mean, I, I've, I've absorbed this book. I've got, I love nothing more than sitting down with an actual physical book. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Kindle reader or anything. But I love listening to a story too when it's when it's well told. You know that that brings another element into it, mm -hmm. and you're you're learning and you're growing. And so why shut doors? Yeah. I don't I don't understand yeah. that. I'm with you on that too. I I've kind of like adapted my own reading habits a little bit in that um, I used to. So this podcast is kind of a lot of times about like, um, you know, self-improvement and things like that. Basically, yeah. whatever I'm really interested in, like talking yeah. to you. But um, but uh, I um, I I've read a lot of self-help in in my day. But I but I did. I used to read them right before bed. And then that's uh -huh. you don't, don't want to do that because then you're like <laughs> your brain is spinning. on Oh, oh God, right. I need to do this. I need to do that. You know, like <laughs> so right. now I actually listen. So like, uh, you know, especially let's say I'm going to talk to an author who's written some, you know, some books in that genre. I listen. I'll listen to a lot of those mm -hmm. on commutes and things like that. And then I save your, the you know, type of books that you write, um, McCullough, Eric Larson, uh, Laura Hillenbrand. I, those are my like before bed books. Uh -huh. And I, I actually uh -huh. am a Kindle yeah. reader. I don't know. Maybe people, some uh -huh. people think that that's I think that's or whatever, but like, yeah, I, yeah. to me, there's nothing better than like ending the day, like reading, getting just mm -hmm. lost in a story, mm -hmm. one of your stories, getting lost in it and then drifting off to sleep. And then it's like, you know, it's t totally takes you out of your own head and all yeah. your stresses and worries are gone and you are just living this, you know, for me right now, living with Winston Churchill and company in Africa <laughs> and figuring out like, you know, what is going on with all these different color muds that are caked all over their, <laughs> over their uniforms and everything <laughs> like that, right? It's just like, I cool, love that. yeah. So like, yeah. I think there's like a, um, almost like a, I don't know if I would call it a self-improvement angle, but to me, there's like a mental health angle mm -hmm. of like losing yes. yourself in a story yes. like the ones that you write. I do this exact same thing. I always um, read right before I go to sleep. And, and yeah, and I also always talk to people about, you know, you're saying the mental health of reading and <clears throat> I, I, I develop a friendship with my books, you know, and I, again, I, there are people kind of sneer at that, you know, but I, I mean, as a child who was shy and quiet, and I, my oldest um, is the same way. Um, there, is, it's it's a it's a comfort mm -hmm. as well as excitement, yeah. and well as taking you to other lands and stuff. It's it's a safe place, right, for you. And um, and I, I I always think of people that you know one of the 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 greatest tragedies of illiteracy, all the other difficulties it brings you life, it denies you that sense of comfort you know and um and safety and friendship and um i, I i've always found that in books yeah yeah 
Okay. I've got a couple more questions for you. I want to be respectful <laughs> of your time here because I'm sure you've got plenty of work to do. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, one thing that struck me uh, reading your books and, and just reading history in general is I'm, I'm always kind of struck by some of these historical figures are very conscious of their legacies. And um, you know, I remember reading like Hamilton and saying like, oh, these, they were thinking way far. They were, they were thinking about us yeah. now and like how they yeah. would be remembered. And I may be totally wrong on this, but I don't, I don't feel like there's a lot of, I mean, maybe there's like some leaders in technology today who are thinking about how they'll be remembered. I don't, I don't feel like a lot of the like politicians out there today are really that focused on like, how am I going to be remembered 200 years from now? I would like to this is kind of a two part question. So it's a little unfair, but I would, I would like to just get your quick take on that. But then I also want to ask you, you know, if you think about your own legacy, I'd like you to think, I'd like to hear about what you'd like that to be. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, I, 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 no one has ever asked me that question, either of the parts of that question. I, and it's, it's not something I've thought about a lot, but my, my first reaction would be, I agree with you. I, I it seems like, Today, um, in modern times especially, everybody wants the now, right? They want you to pay attention to them mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. right? And so every, they want likes or whatever, you know, and they, they want that um, fame maybe and they want attention and they're thinking about now and they're not really thinking about long term. And that's, um, you know, that's a, a bad thing in a lot of different ways because if you just care about what people think now, <laughs> you don't really make good decisions for the future, your own future and the future of other people. And especially if you're in a position, you're some, a politician or something where you can really have an effect, um, that's a really scary thing. And so I, I do agree with you. And I, I do think also, though, it takes a certain kind of person who really thinks about their legacy. It takes mm -hmm. like a Winston Churchill. He used to, you know, always say that he had faith in his star, right? And he, and he, he said, you know, history will be kind to me because I'm going to write it. Right. So he in all ways, Winston yes, Churchill yes. was thinking about his legacy and how he was going to look. But I, I don't think that most people, the average um, person is. And I think for most of us um, and certainly for me, um, my legacy is my children. And that's what matters by far. I mean, I love my job. I love what I do. I'm so grateful to have the opportunity. I mean, I, every day I think I can't believe this is my job. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what I would do if nobody paid me and nobody read it. But I love it. Um, but it like it's not even close, not even a close second to my children, you know, and and raising good people, you know, and I, I, I want them to go out to the world and do great things. And I'm so excited when they have achievements. But I'm most proud of the fact that I believe genuinely that they're really deeply kind people. Mm -hmm. They're really kind. They would never, ever hurt somebody's feelings. They would be horrified if they accidentally hurt somebody's feelings. And I'm, my husband and I are so, so proud of that. And, and I, I think there, you know, there, there's no greater impact we can have on the world than just genuinely being kind to each other. And um, and I think I've genuinely raised kind people. Yeah. And and to me, that's my legacy. And I'm so proud of that. That's cool. That's cool. That's a great way to think about it. And um, I think uh, that sounds like the right prioritization to me. Uh, but I will also <laughs> say you're going to have a great legacy of someone who has um, shown how to tell stories uh, in a really um, just page turning way and showing how to um to bring life back to some of these uh historical uh characters um i think that's going to be a part of your legacy as well and i think like what you've you. done with um garfield in particular is admirable and i and i hope that um you are almost single-handedly i'm sure there's many others involved but uh, sing <laughs> almost single-handedly uh you know uh changing this wrong of history of him being, you know, kind of forgotten. So I think that's going to be part of your legacy too. Um, Thank you very much. Okay. My standard closing question for you. It's uh, kind of a big one, but uh, I'll just hit you with it. Um, what is one thing that you think you've figured out in life that most others haven't yet? Well, probably nothing, um, you know, seismic, but um, the one thing I, I think I've figured out um, 
it, it is, I've used it for writing, but it, it can apply to all of life, is um, something that my husband and I always say to our kids, um, which is the ideas come out of the work. And so you've got to get started. You know, I think sometimes people wait around for lightning to strike or for their opportunity to come. And, and, it, and it, it might come, but you're going to miss it if you're not headed in the right direction, if you're not in there working for yourself. You know, like I said, you know, Churchill always, used to always say that I have faith in my star, but he didn't say, OK, star shine. Mm -hmm. You know, he went out and made things happen. He put himself in these difficult and dangerous situations. He took chances. He worked unbelievably hard in so many different areas. And again, a flawed individual, but really a big, big, big life, you know. And I think that um, with anything, certainly with writing, if you just kind of sit around and, you know, hoping, you know, inspiration will strike or anything in your life, you just have to get in and start working. And it's amazing how these ideas then just start. Oh, you're like, oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. But it takes a lot of work to get there. You know, writing is thinking, but it's an active, you know, involved thinking. You're working on it. And so, um, you know, there, uh, you know, I, I have so much sympathy. I have a lot of nieces and nephews who are kind of in their 20s right now and or maybe early 30s even. And they're just trying to figure out and and they want a job that will really inspire them and that they feel like they can make an impact in the world. And I'm like, absolutely. But you got to just jump in, right? And you have to. I had so many lousy jobs, but I learned mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. from those jobs, not just practical stuff, but I learned about myself, right? And I met people and I, I was like, I, things about I didn't, I mean, I had never, ever thought about writing a book. It didn't even occur to me that I could even be a writer, much less write books. But it's, you know, getting started and taking different kinds of jobs and paying my rent. I had to pay my rent, right? I was supporting myself. And so it's just getting in there and participating in life and learning. And so, yeah, I always say that the ideas come out of the work. I love that one. I love that one. Um, <laughs> it reminds me of um, there's a kind of philosophy that I've had is that you don't kind of find your passion. You, you manufacture it. And it's very, right. very similar related ideas that right. you just exactly. roll your sleeves up and you know, half of the work is finding out what you don't like to do, right? Or mm -hmm. what you're not yes. interested in, right? Yeah. And, um, but just being very action um, oriented. I think that's a great yes, absolutely. piece of advice for and parents fun. and for anybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> Candice, I'm sure all of our listeners are going to immediately want to go out and buy all four of your books. So <laughs> tell us, um, I'm interested, um, you know, where they can find you, but and also what's next for you. Uh, yeah, my books are pretty much anywhere you'd buy books. I'm really lucky in that way. I do have my own website, Um, But uh, um, my next book, actually, I'm very, 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 very excited about it. Um, and it has um, a female lead character. The The main person is a woman. Very cool. And it's um, set in Belgium during World War One, And it's, um, it's actually this uh, network of people who... Um, begin to hide allied soldiers who were injured and during a battle or left behind. And, um, and Germany has occupied Belgium and it's incredibly, incredibly dangerous for everybody. And they start to hide these men and um, give them, you know, food and medical care and find a way to get them to the border with the Netherlands to get out. And um, they are all betrayed um, by a Frenchman and, um, they're all rounded up and arrested in a matter of a couple of days. Wow. And it's what happens to these people, those who survive. And wow. it's just really this extraordinary story of these sort of everyday heroes. I mean, it's a, a nurse, a school teacher, a priest, a, a minor, a prince and princess, brother and sister, um, French, British, and Belgian. And, um, I, I, and, but the, really the two main characters are women. Wow. That sounds so cool. I love it. Um, so in your five year journey, where are you in this in this one? I'm a year in. Okay. I'm a year in. Okay. Yeah. So you're and still so, in research yeah. mode. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. I've done, you know, I, I've, I've sold it. I, you know, did enough to, I always do enough to, you know, write a proposal. Yeah. And, um, I've, you know, that I've got my contract and I've done I've done a lot of the kind of basic reading that I can do from here. And um, I think in the fall, 
Um, I'll be able to, I should be able to go in November and um, do some oh, research, cool. but it's, um, you're going to feel so sorry for me. I might have to go to Belgium. Yeah. I have to go to England, <laughs> France probably yeah. is going to be really rough. So <laughs> I, see a, I see a pattern developing for retirement for you. Is it, okay, where yeah. do we want to go? There's got to be some <laughs> exactly. interesting stories, right? And then I'll find a story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Get out the Very map. Cool. Well, great. I will um, look forward to that one in a few years. Thank you. Um, but uh, listen, in the meantime, um, again, I just want to thank you for doing this. Um, it's been a real pleasure. I'm such a fan. And uh, I thank hope you. that even one more person finds your work uh, because of this uh, conversation. But thank you, Candice. This has been awesome. And uh, we'll speak thank soon. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. It's a, it's a great podcast. Everybody should listen to it. It's so, <laughs> so fascinating. You do a great job. Thank you. Wow. Uh, I told you Candace was awesome. Um, this one was such a special one for me. It's so cool uh, when you're a fan of someone and then they turn out to be even cooler in real life. So amazing stuff. I'm super grateful uh, that I got the chance to have that conversation. So thank you again to Candace. I obviously highly recommend checking out Candace's work. Uh, I don't think you can go wrong with any of her books. River of Doubt, the one about Teddy Roosevelt on the Amazon, that's probably the most famous one she's got to date. But uh, I think I might be partial to Destiny of the Republic, the one about President James Garfield. That one has just really stuck with me and resonated with me. So, But try them all out. I think you're going to love them. Finally, just a quick reminder to head over to gregcampion.substack.com to subscribe to my newsletter. I'll be sharing more in this week's newsletter about this episode. It's one email every other week, the best of what I'm learning from awesome people just like Candace. Uh, and you get to become email buddies with me. Like who wouldn't want to do that, right? Listen, guys, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you next time.